Hello, I'm Timmy Bose. Welcome to the Net Hero Podcast. Unfortunately, we're not doing a video on this week, not because of my guest, because of me, because the little one's got chicken pox, so uh, I'm having to do this from home, and frankly, you don't want to look at my house, it's a space. So, we'll be doing an old school audio one, but that doesn't mean it isn't a cracker, because it tackles a subject that, how do I put it? It's the marmite of energy. You either love it or hate it. Hydrogen. Most people have heard of hydrogen, they probably know, they probably think of things like the Hindenburg, for God's sakes, but that's a long time ago. But hydrogen is obviously a really great energy source. It is a clean energy source if it's made the right way. People believe that hydrogen could be a real major factor in decarbonizing the UK and getting us to our net zero goal. The government really believes in it. There's a hydrogen strategy, there's even hydrogen UK. But lots of academics, lots of people in business, and dare I say lots of commentators, think it's a damn squib. They argue that it will never work because it costs so much to make it. And if you go on LinkedIn, I'm sure you do, you'll find endless debates where people say, this is a folly. Well, is it? And will it work? I'm going to talk today to Daniel Stewart from National Gas, who are looking into hydrogen. You may have read some of this stuff on Future Net Zero and Energy Island News, trying to create a kind of hydrogen transmission network. So, Danielle, thank you and welcome to the Net Hero podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Let's just start with that, okay, before we talk about what the project's doing and all that. You're a very charming person, Danielle, because we were talking just before we went on it. <laughs> <laughs> when people say to you, why are you wasting your time on hydrogen? What is your answer? It's a great question. And it's right that we're all challenged in the energy sector about what we're doing. I think the key thing for me is that we're going to need to explore a mix of technologies and a mix of solutions if we're going to get to net zero. It's a challenge of both scale and of pace. And I can't see that one solution is going to fit all for this. I think there is value in electrification. There's value in hydrogen. There's value in biomethane. All technologies are going to be needed if we're to maintain a secure and resilient energy system in the future. And so when people say you're doing it, you, you must go to talks, you must go to meetings. I don't know. I'm just a commentator and I get <laughs> in the middle of the debate when I say, well, I, I quite like hydrogen. What, what are you saying? What happens? Yeah, so you do get a lot of that. And as you can imagine, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of voices in the energy sector with a lot of differing opinions. And I think you have to believe in what you're doing. And I, I do believe in the work that we're doing. I believe in the science. I believe in the engineering. I'm a scientist by background. I think we have to, as I say, look at all technologies. I don't think we can rule anything out at the moment. What is hydrogen in terms of its role in net zero? Can we sort of take it back to, I know you're a physicist by trade, so this is even better. So we'll, we'll go back to the beginning of <laughs> the universe and the creation. But no, hydrogen, it's not a new source, is it? As I said, people have heard of it probably because of the airships from 100 years ago. But we've been dabbing with hydrogen for about 150 years, haven't we? Yes, hydrogen's not new. It's, one of the most, it's the most abundant chemical in the universe. It's a low carbon alternative for natural gas, potentially. So it burns when it burns. So at the point of use, it burns without producing carbon dioxide. So that means it's a cleaner and greener alternative to natural gas. It can be produced and stored here at scale in the UK. It can um, ensure that we have ongoing energy security in the transition to net zero. And it can easily be transported through our existing pipelines and infrastructure that we have here. So there's a lot of potential for hydrogen. There's parts of the UK industry that perhaps can't electrify, but they could use hydrogen. And this could save thousands of jobs in the UK. But also it represents a historic opportunity for the UK to build new job creating industries. So yeah. government acknowledges or, or believes that we could have to, up to 100,000 jobs by 2050, which really can boost growth and opportunity in parts of the country that would otherwise be left behind. So a lot of potential for hydrogen as an alternative to natural gas, which we know is not sustainable to keep using it in the way that we do today. The big thing about gas, and I'll just call it gas for now, is that we have got it so much, you know, it's so commonplace. It goes where everyone is accessible. You can't really stick a heat pump on the 23rd floor of a tower block, but gas pipes go up there. Yeah. A lot of people have just grown up, I have, with gas as our form of heating, you know, our best form of cooking. So just putting aside the carbon for one moment, there is a thing about gas, its ease of use, that is quite sort of, you know, if we got rid of it and we went all electric, there would be a sort of a cultural issue as well, let alone a kind of net zero and kind of use. There's, a, there's almost like a practical issue around gas, isn't there? 
There is. And 85% of our homes today are heated using natural gas. We're used to it. Many of us don't even think about how the gas reaches our homes. It's just there and it's available when we want it. So it's a huge challenge when we want to think about moving to more sustainable sources of energy. It's not decarbonisation at all costs. We need to think about moving to a more sustainable future, but in a way that is affordable and maintains energy security for everyone. So that fair and equitable transition to net zero is really, really important. So absolutely, it's going to be a challenge and behavioural change is a big part of that as well. Yeah. We need to bring people along that journey with us. Yeah, I mean, your boss, John Butterworth, who spoke at our uh, Big Zero show, you know, like John, we have good conversations. And that's one of his big things is, you know, gas can be part of the, the solution for an equitable transition. And that is very important because it's all very well, you know, right now it's kind of, you know, a few people who are wealthy can have solar panels and all of this stuff. It's all quite expensive. And hopefully all the price of that will come down do you believe that if we can sort of clean up gas gas can fill a role to do this kind of more you know equitable way of, of transitioning i do and i think it's going to play an essential part in the energy mix so natural gas today plays a key role a critical role yeah. um, in the uk's energy supply it helps to preserve uk's energy security so that people get the energy when they need it but we do recognize we need to move away from fossil fuels and we need to do that quickly Hydrogen is a gas, it's an alternative gas, and that does present an opportunity for the UK to maintain its security of supply, continue to use gas in the way that we use it today, perhaps less energy demand in the future for gas, but still as a complementary solution to increase electrification from renewable. Today, it's like an insurance policy for the country. So when the system's under a lot of stress and demand for electricity is high, you know, gas can come in and help to generate that electricity. There were 260 days last year where gas supplied over 30% of the nation's electricity. So if you think about what would happen if gas wasn't there, you know, that, I don't really want to think about that necessarily yeah, because yeah, it. it would put us in a tricky situation. I mean, look, I'm just looking. We're, we're recording this today and it's a sunny day. And actually, you know, we're doing very well on renewables, 70% from renewables on the national grid kind of generation thing. 6% is fossil fuels. And that is all gas at present, right? And obviously you're right, when the weather shifts and we haven't got as much solar and, and wind, then gas fills it up. So in terms of cleaning up gas, why is hydrogen seen as a real kind of go-to solution? What What is it? You said that it burns cleanly for a start. Is it practical to be used? Because a lot of people worry about the explosive nature of, well, general gas is, has an explosive name, but hydrogen has always been one that, you know, can ignite so quickly. So let's go through a few of the myths. Can you transport hydrogen gas safely in our current gas pipes? Yes. So there's a lot of work being undertaken at the moment. So I think the first thing to say is that we won't see hydrogen in our energy system unless it can be made safe. Right. And we work very closely with safety regulators in the UK, so the, the HSC, to make sure that we have all of the necessary measures in place. And there's a lot of testing and innovative projects that are taking place right now to ensure that it can be safely and reliably transported around the country for different purposes. National Gas has a number of projects. There's two key flagship projects, Project Union and our Future Grid project, looking to do this. Our Future Grid program is looking at how our current existing infrastructure would behave with various levels of hydrogen in it. So we've built a test facility at Spade Adam in Cumbria made up of assets, so pipelines and valves and other bits and pieces that we see on the network today yeah. that have previously been in service. We've put them back together to create a mini network in Spade Adam and we're currently starting to put 2%. So last month, actually, we reached a key milestone, 2% hydrogen mixed in with natural gas supply around that test facility to really understand how our existing assets and infrastructure behave and to make sure that we can build that safety case for hydrogen in the infrastructure. By the end of the year, we hope to see up to 100% hydrogen running through those assets. So a lot of data that we'll collect from that. Data is really critical in all of this yeah. to really understand what we need to do to those assets, if anything, to make sure they are safe. The project you mentioned, Project Union, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you're trying to build about, <clears throat> you know, 1,500, 1,600 miles worth of pipeline to show how it could work. So is this a kind of, you know, are you having to construct new things? Talk us through what, what you're doing and how are you uh, making sure that you're monitoring that the pipelines 
you know, don't leak. We've all heard of gas leaks, right? And that that's one thing. And generally, natural gas leaks at a certain rate and in low volumes can't isn't te- terrible. But hydrogen is a very different ballgame. So let's talk about the project and what you're doing in terms of where you're testing these pipelines. So, so maybe I'll start, if you don't mind, just with the, the question around leakage yeah. as it happens. So it's really critical that we keep gas in pipe, whether that's natural gas or whether that's hydrogen, because it, well, for obvious reasons, safety reasons, but also it can have an impact on the environment. So today we have done a lot of work in national gas to reduce leakage and losses of natural gas. And some of the testing that we've seen today, both at a national gas transmission level, but also at distribution level. So distribution networks operate the lower pressure pipelines around the country have shown that if it doesn't leak with natural gas, it won't leak with hydrogen because it's, it's tight. Right. Um, so right. there's a lot of work. You don't have to change the pipe. You don't have to change the, the material the pipe's made of. Not the pipes itself, absolutely. Right. So there's a lot of work being done around some of maybe some of the assets, of the other assets, to ensure that we minimise leakage. Um, but it's it's something that we do very well at today in comparison to perhaps other transmission system operators around the world. So that's something that's really important. So we're focused on that. Yeah. In terms of Project Union, so this is an area that I'm very excited about. So this is a programme of work that I lead. It's a programme of work to look at how we can where possible, repurpose our existing natural gas infrastructure in the UK to carry 100% hydrogen by the early to mid 2030s. So we want to create a backbone of pipelines, if you like, high pressure pipelines that connect up hydrogen supply in the future to storage and to people who want to use hydrogen in the future. So whether that's large industrials or power generators or connection to the distribution networks that so that it might be used in homes in the future. So it's connecting up those large centers of production um, to strategic locations. Where are you testing? Where, where, where is it being built, this project, or or being run from? Absolutely. So at the moment, we're in the early stages, so it's still desktop studies on the actual <laughs> okay, right, design. Yeah. So the programme of work covers a range of things. So it's looking at what is the size and the shape of that network? What does it need to be in the future? What are our customers and stakeholders saying they need? So we believe we need up to 2,000 kilometres of a network to create that backbone that spans the length and breadth of the country. So it will start by connecting up the large industrial clusters in the UK with strategic supply locations. So there's five key concentrated areas of industry known as industrial clusters in the UK that represent around 50% of industrial emissions. So where are they mainly? So typically around the coast. So there's some in the northeast, the northwest, South Wales, and in Scotland too. Yeah. Um, and on the south coast, if you include Southampton too. So is, is it generally where the big refineries have been? Like, you know, you go to Port Talbot. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we're getting a picture of where this is. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So those areas and then St Fergus in Scotland, where we have a lot of natural gas supply today, we believe that yeah. that's a, a potential for hydrogen supply in the future. And then in Bacton, where we're currently connected to the rest of mainland Europe. So subsea pipelines known as interconnectors connect into our network in the UK and gas can flow either way. So we want to continue to connect to that that pipeline or a set of pipelines that go to Europe to enable cross-border trade in the future. So that's an initial backbone. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the future demand for hydrogen, we may grow out of there and start to repurpose more of our pipelines. Fundamentally, we want to repurpose our pipelines where possible because we believe that's a much cheaper way to create a network compared to building new, although we do recognise there may be some need for some new build infrastructure in order to retain supply. Why do you say repurpose? When we started, you said, oh, you can use it in the existing. Why are we having to repurpose then? I don't don't quite get that. Sure. So maybe that's a language thing. So repurpose potentially means do nothing on some of our infrastructure. (laughs) So it means we use it, really. You're not not ripping them out, putting new things in not necessarily, no. So we believe most of our pipelines, we don't need to do much to at all, right. if anything, to make them ready for hydrogen. There may be some assets that sit on our network that you need to do something or replace to make them hydrogen ready. So things like our compressors. So okay. we have compressors strategically located around our system, which help to kind of maintain high pressures in our, our pipelines and help to pump gas around the system. Those compressors might be OK with a mix of hydrogen, so a blend of hydrogen in the natural gas supply up to a certain volume, but as you move to 100% hydrogen, you may need to replace certain parts or or entire bits and pieces. But the pipelines themselves, we believe in the majority, can be reused, if you like, rather than repurposed without intervention. Yeah, so we're, the project is still in kind of infancy and it's it's all theoretical right now, yeah? Yes, very much so. We're in the stage where what we call our pre-feed studies, so pre-front-end engineering design studies. Um, we recently secured funding to be able to progress a 12-month programme of work, which looks at a number of things. 
it looks at where would you start the transition of the network to, to be able to repurpose it for hydrogen mm -hmm. and where would you finish and where would you go to in between and the timing. And that will be very much dependent on customers' needs and drivers. It will be dependent on policy and where it might be easiest to repurpose some of our assets. So where we've got long stretches of pipeline that maybe don't need a compressor to be replaced on it. The second key thing under our pre-feed studies is looking at which of our pipelines so we have multiple pipelines around the country. Which ones would we want to take out for hydrogen? And which ones would we want to keep operating on natural gas so that we can continue to supply natural gas over that transition? So that, that's our pre-feed study. Right. And then we've got another of, number of other market enabling activities that we're looking at too. It's not just about the infrastructure. We're looking at the supply chain. Is it ready? So manufacturing capability to support such a project, skills and resources and the people needed in the future to operate a net zero energy system. We're looking at our policies and standards for engineering standards. We're looking at a whole range of things. So a lot of activity over the next 12 months. When will we see any of this? So yeah. all, all this is great. When, when are you actually going to start changing some pipes or repurposing or starting to put hydrogen in the system? Are we talking five years, 10 years, or will it be quicker than that? Great question. So we have an ambition to start conversion or perhaps construction, but conversion from 2026, which means we need to have done all of our detailed engineering design studies wow. ahead of then. So that's our ambition. And we'd like to see that 2000 mm -hmm. kilometer or 1500 kilometers, whatever the, the ultimate number is of backbone in place by the early to mid 2030. So it's a really ambitious program. Let's go through a few things. Thanks for explaining. I think people can understand it. The general way that gas has worked in this country is we've got it Either it comes in, so let's park that for now, but big containers and they come into a port and off it goes and you take it out there. Or it's from the sea, right? mainly the North Sea. Will hydrogen come from the same route? Because there are many different ways of making hydrogen. Probably the listeners have heard of it. But one of the things people are talking about is using things like existing uh, wind farms and spinning off, the, the creating uh, hydrogen using the, the energy there. But... I don't know where it could come from elsewhere. So what I'm trying to get to is at present we've got refineries who are built on places where there are gas beds and that's where they'll come in. Will that be the same story for hydrogen? Another great question. So we believe that hydrogen will land in bulk at some of the same places we see natural gas in bulk today. So the reason for connecting up right. those large industrial clusters is that we believe that that's where we'll see hydrogen production at scale in the early days. And then those strategic locations such as St Fergus, which is where we have a gas terminal today, and Bacton that I mentioned earlier. So at scale, that's where we believe it will happen. As you rightly mentioned, there's a number of ways of making hydrogen and they're often referred to as colours. Um, there's all kinds of colours, the full colours of the rainbow, yeah. um, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, pink and many others. Depending on how it's made, that will determine geographically where you might see it. Well, that's what I'm saying. The grey hydrogen people talk about as a byproduct from, you know, the hydrocarbon industry. That might be very, somewhere very different to where yeah. your refineries are. Or, you know, and green hydrogen can be made anywhere, technically. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So what I'm trying to get at, and you know, if a balance, won't people say, well, hang on a second, you're trying to base this on an existing gas network and you're not thinking of where the future might be. Yeah, so coincidentally, unfortunately, however the way you, you want to look at it, we believe our network happens to be in many of the right places to be able to access that hydrogen production. <laughs> that's, that's always a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one I made earlier. That's good. I like it. Absolutely. So it's a Blue Peter version of yeah. you know, we, we have our network. It's ready to go. So in the most part, that's the case. But you're absolutely right. Green hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from renewable electricity yeah. and water, um, could be made anywhere, although ideally located close to electricity connections and where it makes sense, you know, and, and potentially where wind and solar is, is being used to make that electricity. So okay. I get it. There are some better locations than others, but we believe the network is more or less in all the right places. So fortunate in that way. Isn't there a criticism? And I, again, I'm not massive. I did do science, but I'm not a massive science head. But people talk about the energy density of hydrogen, that it, it's kind of it's not as it doesn't have enough as, as much energy in it as natural gas. And so you have to, you know, has a lower energy volume. So this reduces the amount your pipelines can transport and eventually reduce the amount of energy output. Is there any truth in that? Can you explain a bit about that? Yes. So there's some truth in that. So what I would say is by volume, hydrogen has about a third of the energy that natural gas right. of an equivalent volume would have, which means that you have to move a greater volume of hydrogen 
to give you the same amount of energy output. Yeah. However, in the future, demand for gas of whatever kind is likely to go down. So therefore, you perhaps don't need the same size network as you would have today. Yeah. However, there are ways to, to move that energy much more quickly. So without going into lots of the, the physics and the science of it, you can potentially move and flow that gas much more quickly through our network than we do today. And you can also look at options to change the pressure at which we operate our network, which again can help flow that gas more quickly through the network. So these are the sorts of tests that we're doing to understand, is that credible? Is that possible? What's the size and the shape of the network that you're going to need to transport the potential volumes of energy that you're going to need in the future? What about the issue about hydrogen itself at the end? Because, you know, I try, I got a boiler <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> and I did say to my people, oh, well, yeah, I'd like to get a hydrogen. It went, ain't any of about, mate. You can't get them. <laughs> and I know they are being built. But, you know, people talk about, you know, I'm old, but I'm not that old. But apparently there used to be a mix of hydrogen with gas they used to call it town gas in the sort of 50s and 60s i think in this country so hydrogen before the whole north sea thing was part of kind of what we got as the end user so earlier on you talked about 100 percent hydrogen how useful is it can we get to using a mix of hydrogen before uh, to, to help us decarbonize or does it have to be the 100 percent? and if that's the case where does it go for the end user blending is, is typically how we we talk about when you've blending, got a mix yeah. of hydrogen with natural gas and there's some key decisions actually being made by government towards the end of this year to look at whether or not at a distribution network level so the lower pressure pipelines you can blend up to 20 percent hydrogen into the natural gas network but what difference would that make danielle in terms of how much cleaner our gas would be when we burn it sure so 20 percent hydrogen in the in, in your natural gas mix doesn't actually save 20% emissions. It's uh -huh. around 6 or 7% emission saving. Yeah. So blending is very much seen as a transitionary step towards perhaps 100% hydrogen in the future. The reason that 20% is the number that often gets talked about at distribution level is that your existing boilers in your homes don't need to change. There's nothing that would need to happen and they could accept 20% hydrogen. There we go. Yeah, the cost side of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is the real quandary, isn't it? Which is, the science could get us there. You, you deal with the science, you get cleaner, that's fine. But then there's a cost element that has got to be balanced because we've got to make this affordable for everyone. We do. And and we talked earlier about the need for kind of a fair and equitable and affordable transition for, for everybody. And that's partly why, you know, blending is a potential route through to 100 percent hydrogen um, there's a behavioral thing in there and getting used to having hydrogen yeah. in the network as much as there is kind of technically and environmentally you know there's some opportunities there too um, it is going to be really critical that we bring people along that journey many people say that this, this is all fine if you're going to use hydrogen it'll only be for bulk it'll only be for shipping or you know for freight it really won't affect businesses what's your take on that I think that's an interesting perspective and, and the amount of hydrogen and where it's going to be used is still to be fully determined. There's, there's more work to do in yeah. that. I think it's clear that there are some industries that can't be fully electrified and so they're going to need to find alternative solutions and, yeah, sure. and hydrogen could be one of those solutions. The other thing is there's ambition, obviously, to have a net zero power system, so an electricity system by 2035, but that also needs to be a resilient power system. Um, and we've mentioned already there are days where Perhaps when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't isn't blowing, to, to coin a term that's possibly overused these days. <laughs> <Not our. laughs> exactly. We still need to generate electricity and today that's done by gas. So in the future, hydrogen could fill that gap and be used to ensure that we have a resilient electricity system too. So there are businesses and there are uses where electrification may not be the solution for them. So again, coming back to that need for a mix of solutions and consumer choice is going to be really critical. If you went to a combined gas turbine plant now, you know, there are plenty of them around the country, could they run tomorrow on hydrogen or would it take quite a lot of fixing and, and dubering to, to make them as effective in terms of the energy they produce, the electricity they produce? Yeah, so for some locations, so 100% hydrogen, there would need to be some changes to the plant. And I think that's widely accepted and acknowledged that yeah. there will need to be some investment there. For blending, it varies very slightly by the type of industry and the equipment that's being used. But up to a certain point, blending hydrogen in with the natural gas mix would mean no change or minimal change for those industries and those power generators. So again, that's something we're working very closely with our customers and our stakeholders. We have a lot of power generators connected to our system yeah. to really understand what it is they need to do to make sure that we can be fully aligned and make sure that we're serving everybody's needs. I think that's going to be one of the key challenges of this transition 
is alignment across the full value chain, making sure we've got hydrogen there when it's needed, making sure storage is available because of that energy sure. density yeah. thing point that we talked about already, but also making sure our customers are ready to transition and that the network's available. So, so it's a real big kind of coordination effort that's going to be needed. Before we go, let's get a couple of points, which I think probably the listeners would want to know. Where are the big power companies on this? I mean, are they on board? Right. So obviously you're the transmission network, you're, you're there to move the stuff. But if people aren't spinning it out of green or making it, then there's no point. So could you say, I mean, one of the things you mentioned earlier is our energy security, which we've really seen with the issue with the Ukraine war. And that definitely falls in the path of backing hydrogen because you can make it here. But is there an interest? Is there enough demand from the big generators to say, yes, we're going to start making this stuff? for you guys to transmit it. Absolutely. So again, as I mentioned, we're engaging very, very much with our customers and stakeholders to understand what they need. And we're getting overwhelming support actually for Project Union, for example, because of the need for that. What I would say is that there's lots of solutions available. And if we take the, the example of power generators, they're considering natural gas with carbon capture and storage solutions. They're considering hydrogen solutions. There's a number of solutions yep. available to them. And that would depend on the age of their assets, the location of their assets and access to hydrogen. But overwhelmingly, we've got really positive support for a 100% hydrogen network that power generators and industries can access around the country. What will this mean if it all comes together by 2030, something or another, and we've got hydrogen coming through? What does it mean for me? I run my business, even for me domestically. What, what, what will I see? How will it make any difference to the quality of, of, our, of our lives as opposed to, you know, dare I say? sticking some batteries or, or doing something else which is kind of fairly immediate where do you see this i mean the obvious benefit for using hydrogen compared to natural gas if we start there is obviously the decarbonization and um, benefits that you get from it and you know every organization is going to have to move to a decarbonized solution eventually and um, so and there's cost savings to be made for that because ultimately you'll be penalized for for um, yeah. use of fossil yeah. fuels compared to electrified solutions it's not a one-size-fits-all Electrification will absolutely be the right solution for some businesses, but perhaps, as we've mentioned, there are some organisations that can't use electricity, so they might need to, to look at an alternative solution. One of the benefits of continuing to use a gas solution is that it's minimally disruptive, and you can look at yeah. lots of different use yeah. cases for this, but there's very little change to the way that we do things. For some organisations, and they're very specific things that they do and produce and make and manufacture there will be some differences in what they might need to do because of the temperatures and the way that hydrogen behaves compared to natural gas. But there's a lot of work going on to understand that. And lots of organisations are engaged in that process to understand what would need to happen. Have we got the ability to have more energy security, i.e. our own hydrogen, to meet all our needs? Do you see that? Is that part of the work you're doing to try and predict our demand? Obviously, that's one of the big things is can we meet our own demand? Yes. So that is the starting point for all of the work that we do is, is trying to look at various energy futures and what level of hydrogen might you see in the economy. I think it's widely accepted you need some level of hydrogen in the economy to meet net zero. But again, how much is yet to be determined? So we look at a range of futures, which then helps us determine the size and shape of the infrastructure needed to support that too. And obviously there's talking to customers to understand what they see as the future. Yeah. But also we yeah. use forecast scenarios, if you like, perhaps not forecast, but energy future scenarios. So the electricity system operator, so national grid electricity system operator produces future energy scenarios that much of the industry uses to look at those potential futures and what the range of hydrogen or electrification might be in those futures. Climate Change Commission has published a number of um, scenarios that they use to look at as well as government and others so we look at all of this and try and pull all of that together to get an idea of what that future could look like and make sure that we're preparing for that and actually what we need is to invest in solutions early on that potentially have benefits or could offer value across all of those scenarios so they're kind of low regrets investments now so that we can achieve what we need to achieve in the future but it could help us by by giving us the ability to say we don't need to get imports. That that's I suppose that's the end game, isn't it? No more it uh, natural gas, yeah, whatever it is, LPG, whatever the future is. You won't need an LPH or whatever yes. it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, we'll have our own. That, that that's what we're planning for. It is, and and we believe that you can produce and store hydrogen at scale here in the UK, and that's one of the big benefits of hydrogen. You know, when we talked about security of supply. That's going to be really critical. Um, reducing our resilience on alternative supplies from outside of the UK and boosting that energy yeah. security yeah. is going to be really, really critical. And we believe that hydrogen has the potential to, to help us with that. 
2050 mm -hmm. and my burning, I've got a hydrogen powered <laughs> car, hydrogen boiler, and I get on my hydrogen bus and take a flight powered by hydrogen. Is that your dream world, Danielle? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that would be an interesting world, wouldn't it? I, I think, um, as we say, it has a role to play in potentially all yeah. kinds of uses. You're very good, very political. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, but absolutely, it does have a, a potential role. I, to me, at the moment, 2050 is about making sure that we reach a world that is decarbonised yeah. with all solutions. You, you know, hydrogen, I'd love to see it in all applications. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you believe in it, don't you? You do believe in it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing all of this, I, I guess. Absolutely. I don't think you could do this this job if you didn't believe in it. And and the great thing, actually, about National Gas Transmission is there's a lot of people who really genuinely want to make a difference as part of that organisation and believe that hydrogen can play a role in that. So I work with some very enthusiastic people okay. and we're attracting many more people and um, young people who do want to make that difference in society and, and are looking at climate change and saying we need to do something so i feel very fortunate to work with some very enthusiastic great people and clever people too i hope you wear a t-shirt saying hydrogen's cool or something like that <laughs> lighter than air <laughs> daniel stewart you've been fantastic thank you so much for joining us on the era podcast check out the whole project union i'm sure there's some stuff out there is there on uh, for people to have a read there is yeah. absolutely so national gas transmissions website plenty of information and obviously feel free to reach out to to us at national gas too we're very happy to share information yeah i think i think it's an interesting one because people do have questions about hydrogen i know it's one of those ones where people think it might be too far, far away but you know as you're saying if we can get some stuff going soon then maybe it'll become more of a reality um thanks for joining us on the podcast do listen to the podcast again if you've missed out share it with friends and make sure you subscribe we'll be back doing some videos very soon daniel thanks for joining us this week please make sure you follow us on social media until the next time catch you soon you've been listening to the net hero podcast with summit bows from future net zero visit our platform for all things net zero and if you or your business is doing great things on the path to net zero and want to be featured on the podcast email net hero at futurenetzero.com. Follow us on social media. futurenetzero.com. Better business, better planet.